So hello everyone, my name is Dr. Minu Ratnas Bhapati and I'm a research engineer at the Space Enabled Research Group at MIT's Media Lab. On behalf of Space Enabled and Secure World Foundation, with whom we're co-organizing this event series titled Serving Society with Space Data, we welcome you to the series that's focused on how satellite applications are being used for the humanitarian and development sectors in support of the sustainable development goals. So thank you all for joining us from around the world. Many of us who are in our respective remote offices, as we discuss today's topic, SDG seven, affordable and clean energy. So before we get started, a few housekeeping notes. Uh, firstly, this webinar will be recorded and made available to the public. The webinar will also be closed captioned, uh, which you can find at the bottom of this video screen. And finally, we also want to ensure that you are part of this discussion. So uh, as part of the webinar today, we'll be using the Slido web platform to run live audience questions during the webinar as well as allowing time for the audience Q&A. So we invite you to go to Slido either on the app or the website and use our event page um, uh, SDG7. So let's get started with the webinar. Energy is regarded as a key enabler for sustainable development. And yet the transition towards clean and sustainable sources of energy is considered as one of the greatest challenges that we as humanity face today. Energy consumption and production contribute to two thirds of global emissions and 81% of the global energy system is based on fossil fuels, the same percentage as 30 years ago. So space technologies such as Earth observation and global uh, navigation satellite systems or GNSS offer a unique insight into locations of renewable energy infrastructure, forecast environmental impacts of energy use and support timing and synchronization of energy fields which play a really critical role in developing solutions for universal access to energy. Satellite data also enables us to track and forecast climate variability and changes so that extreme weather or sea level rise, which can threaten energy reliability and resilience can be tracked and forecasted. So what we've been seeing recently is that energy, uh, sorry, industry, agencies, governments, research institutions, academia, as well as the nonprofit sector are leading global efforts to assess energy access deficits and helping to analyze country specific data on access to electricity and clean cooking, as well as tracking official progress towards renewables and energy efficiency all relating to SDG 7.1, 7.2, and 7.3. But it's not just about the data. It's also how we use the data to create a more inclusive, sustainable, affordable, and secure global energy system by supporting effective policies and spurring private sector actions and public-private cooperation. So let's kick off our webinar with a poll question to find out where the biggest obstacle is when utilizing satellite data for energy policy. So again, I remind everybody to please go to slido.com using the event link uh, SDG7. And here we have our um, our question. So let me then go to our panel. Okay. 
So our panel today features experts who will showcase examples of projects aimed at tracking why clean and affordable energy is needed, how countries are working towards achieving the SDG goals and indicators, and how to further increase capacity for the utilization of earth observation data among utility providers. So we start with our first panelist, Dr. Susmita Dasgupta, lead environmental economist in the Development Economies Research Group of World Bank. Her research focus is on environmental management in developing countries. Dr. Dasgupta and her colleagues recently published a policy research paper that looks at tracking traffic and air pollution using satellite data. So Susmita, thank you very much for joining us today. We'd be happy to hear about your research at the World Bank and how you've been utilizing space data more. I'll hand it over to you, Susmita. Thank you, Minu. Hello, friends. It's great to meet you all virtually. Today, I will share with you our recent research on traffic congestion, air pollution, and exposure of vulnerable population. But first and foremost, I would like to thank my colleagues, Dr. David Wheeler and Dr. Shomit Lal for this research. Next slide, please. Cost of air pollution is staggering. WHO attributes about 4.2 million annual premature deaths to outdoor air pollution. More than 80% of people living in urban areas are exposed to air quality levels that exceed WHO guidelines. In major metropolitan areas, transport sector is a key contributor to outdoor air pollution. According to the World Bank, welfare losses from outdoor fine particulate and ozone pollution alone ranges from 4.8% of GDP equivalent in East Asia to 1.5% in Sub-Saharan Africa. Air pollution is getting serious attention also in connection with COVID-related infections and fatalities. Air pollution compromises immune systems, so higher infection rates and fatalities are expected in high pollution areas. Transmission of the virus through aerosols is also a subject of concern. Bottom line, living with the current level of air pollution is not even an option. Next, please. Our team is working on air pollution mitigation in World Bank client countries since early 90s. Limited information prevented us from designing effective, spatially targeted interventions for reducing traffic congestion and pollution. Local congestion and pollution are often poorly measured because monitoring systems are sparse, costly, and difficult to maintain. As a result, we had no choice but to estimate citywide congestion from observations on few traffic arteries, and we estimated air pollution from aggregate fuel consumption data, coupled with air pollutant emission factors for gasoline and diesel vehicles generated from very small samples. There was no way of figuring out where exactly pollution was originating, where pollution was getting dispersed by wind, and who were getting exposed. Next, please. In recent years, availability of granular geocoded data, satellite images, etc., gave us a huge break. Our research has started using high resolution data in public domain to analyze traffic patterns, satellite readings of air pollution and geocoded data on port to understand vulnerable populations' exposure to air pollution and where intervention for pollution mitigation will make a difference. So far, we conducted the research for Dar es Salaam in Tanzania and Dhaka in Bangladesh. I would present our research on Dar in next few slides. Next, please. In Dar, a bus rapid transit service began operating in 2016. Yet the metro region is experiencing major slowdowns on primary roads during morning and evening rush hours. European Space Agency's Sentinel 5P measures four air pollutants generated by vehicular emissions, nitrogen dioxide, ozone, carbon monoxide, and sulfur dioxide. For this pilot exercise, we focused on NO2, an air pollutant identified by epidemiologists 
causing serious respiratory problems for children and cardiopulmonary problems for the elderly. Our information on vulnerable residents of Dar came from maps assembled by the WorldPOP project of the University of Southampton. And the time period of our analysis was from August 2018 to May 2019. Next, please. Vehicle traffic is a major contributor to NO2 pollution in Dar metro region. Therefore, to start with, real-time traffic reports for Dar provided by Google Map were processed for understanding the temporal pattern of traffic condition. Regional hourly traffic speeds on primary loads highlighted the expected traffic pattern, higher speed during the weekends, declining traffic speeds twice during morning and evening rise rush hours in weekdays, and it also highlighted more volatility in the worst traffic conditions as compared to the average condition. Next, please. For understanding the spatial pattern of traffic, we computed a composite traffic volume indicator by administrative division. The indicator showed a roughly concentric spatial ordering of traffic volume with the highest intensities in seven administrative divisions highlighted on this slide with the color uh, magenta. From the analysis of traffic, it was immediately apparent that these seven divisions are the dominant sources of vehicular NO2 emissions in the metro area of Dar. Next, please. Then we investigated the spatial dynamics of NO2 pollution. We used Google Earth Engine for extraction of daily imagery of NO2 from Sentinel 5P for the metro region. We computed monthly mean NO2 concentration, and three patterns were immediately evident. For the afternoon period 2 to 3 p.m., the NO2 cloud produced by vehicles centered in the core area of Dar is consistently displaced to neighboring areas. Direction of dispersion of the pollution cloud northwest, west, southwest, or northward depends on the month of the year. And there is a seasonal variation in the intensity of the pollution cloud. NO2 concentration is noticeably lighter in January, April, and May. Deeper analysis later revealed seasonal weather factors, temperature, humidity, and wind speed drive major seasonal variations in pollution intensity and accompanying changes in wind direction drive the locus of air pollution. Next, please. Now let me move to our exposure vulnerability analysis. As I mentioned before, World Pop project gave us the distribution of vulnerable population in Dar, the number of children less than five years and elderly adults, 65 plus, in four households in each one square kilometer grid cell. We work with alternative measures of poverty and vulnerability as shown on this slide. Next, please. We combined NO2 pollution from the source adjusted with the distance decay function and weather conditions with the count of vulnerable residents in each one square kilometer grid along the dispersion path of the pollution. And that produced the composite NO2 exposure vulnerability measures for the study area displayed on this slide. Results indicate pollution exposure is worst for vulnerable population in areas that are in the wind path from high traffic areas and in seasons when pollution is maximized by weather factors. Expected results. Next, please. Finally, we tried to identify where interventions will make a difference for reducing this NO2 exposure. For each location, where pollution exposure is high for vulnerable population, we traced back the source locations of the pollution and carefully identified where traffic congestion, congestion reduction will be most effective. Traffic areas by congestion relief priorities are depicted on this slide. Now to sum up, I would like to emphasize that our assess assessments for that is a pilot exercise. To our knowledge, these high resolution information sources have not previously been combined for an integrated regional assessment of any city. We expect researchers and policymakers will now be able to revisit distributional impacts of pollution 
and identify pollution mitigation measures for any developing country cities with these new information sources. Next. Thank you all for tuning in today. Thank you so much to Smita for setting the scene as to why we need affordable and clean energy initiatives and why they're so crucial in achieving SDG 7 by 2030. I, I know you did mention that the uh, this was a pilot project in Dar, but you are also working on a project in uh, Bangladesh. And I think that there are many other countries around the world that would really benefit with this sort of research and project. So I hope that uh, when we have time for question and answer a little bit later in this webinar, you can elaborate a little bit more about what you found from this pilot project and what are the lessons learned that you've been able to apply for the project in, um, in Bangladesh. So thank you very much, Susmita. Um, I wanna remind you all to firstly respond to our live poll question and also submit your own questions to our panelists on Slido using the event name SDG7. Our next panelist is Dr. Shonali Pachori, who is the Senior Research Scholar with Energy Program and Acting Program Director of the Transitions to New Technologies Program at the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis in Austria. She serves on the Science Advisory Panel of the Climate and Clean Air Coalition and on the Advisory Group for the International Network on gender and energy. Dr. Pachori joins us today to talk about access to energy and electrification in relation to SDG 7 indicators. Shanali, thank you so much for joining us and sharing a little bit about your research and the outcomes that you've been able to find in this sector. Thank you, Minu, uh, and greetings to everyone who's joining this webinar. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to have the opportunity to share a little bit about the research we've been doing uh, in this space. Uh, so first, I'd like to thank my co-authors on this work. This work was led by Giacomo Falcetta, who is a PhD student in Italy and who led the work and is doing this research as part of his PhD thesis. I also uh, would like to thank uh, Simon Parkinson and Ed Byers, two colleagues of mine who work also at IASA, who contributed to this research. Um, the idea of this research was to really look at how we might use Earth observation data to really try to assess access to electricity in regions where we have difficulties with uh, getting regular uh, sources of information that allow you to do this kind of tracking regularly. Uh, as we've already heard, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals provide a global framework for objectives and uh, targets that we want to achieve by 2030. And there's, of course, a global indicator framework that also really looks at specific indicators that are regularly uh, and uh, repeatedly tracked to provide progress on these uh, different goals. Uh, however, for many of uh, the developing world nations, uh, providing regular access to data is, is a costly endeavor and, and is not always done in a regular um, fashion. Uh, for this reason, we felt that uh, satellite and Earth observation data can really provide a, a big complementary source of information to track these goals. Uh, next slide, please. So in the work that we wanted to do, we wanted to really look at um, how we could use uh, Earth observations to complement existing sources of information to track SDG 7.1.1, which is uh, basically access to modern electricity services universally. And in this work, we decided to focus on Sub-Saharan Africa because this is the region which has the largest access deficit when it comes to electricity access. 
uh, more than 50% of the population there still lacks access to electricity. And of course, the lack of access is more pronounced in rural areas than uh, urban cities and urban centers. Uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, we have 15 countries where electrification levels today are still below 25%. Now, in uh, focusing on Sub-Saharan Africa, we also decided on, on this particular region for a couple of other reasons. One being that available data sources are scarce in this, in this region. Normally, access is tracked through household surveys. These are, of course, costly uh, and, and time-consuming to undertake. And therefore, we felt that Earth observations and geospatial spatial information that are often continuous in their spatial and temporal uh, resolution uh, provide a really good opportunity to try to track access to electricity. Uh, next slide, please. So our approach in this work was really straightforward. We decided that we would like to create an open source updatable data set to track electricity access by using nightlight based satellite imagery on luminosity and to really focus on this region, uh, this period between 2014 and 2019, which really uh, is, is uh, in line with how the SDGs have been formulated and the targets have been set. So as we know, SDGs came into force in 2015. Uh, we are now in 2020. So this period of 2014 to 2019 really reflects the period just uh, starting with this SDG process. Uh, in our analysis, we also use the Google Earth Engine as was mentioned by Sushmita in her own work. Uh, and uh, this provided us with a state-of-the-art cloud computing platform. Uh, in our analysis, we decided to focus separately on rural and urban areas because, of course, we have seen even uh, from traditional sources of information that access to electricity varies tremendously uh, across these regions. Uh, then we wanted furthermore to process the data so that we could really look at province level differences in access to electricity because uh, the national tracking efforts basically focus largely at aggregates at the national level, uh, sometimes separating, separating this by rural and urban, but of course for planning purposes and, and for really deciding where interventions are needed most, one needs to really understand the sub-regional inequalities in access to electricity. So we really decided to do this at the provincial level uh, for Sub-Saharan Africa. And then furthermore, we thought about how we could really try to focus on more than just a binary uh, analysis of where there is light and where there isn't light to also look at the quality of light. So really looking at luminosity in terms of its quality and trying to use that as a proxy for trying to understand where um, uh, demand for electricity is growing and where it isn't. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, here are just some details on the inputs that were used for doing our analysis. And I won't uh, repeat what's on the slide verbally in detail, but what I would like to highlight here is really the fact that our, our approach was really to layer multiple types of Earth observation data to try to derive indicators that then can tell us more about both areas where there is light and there isn't light, but then furthermore also on looking at quality of light in terms of luminosity. And uh, in further to use of these various uh, sources of open access earth observation data sets, we also validated our results, uh, our analysis by comparing what we uh, analyzed using the satellite data sets with other uh, public sources of data such as the Dem Demographic Health Service, the DHS Service, the World Bank SMAM Electrification Database, and also the new World Bank Multi-Tier Framework Service, which really try to look at access in a multi-dimensional way. Next slide, please. 
So uh, this slide just basically gives you uh, 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 an idea of what were the outputs from this data set construction. So the data set is publicly available. We wanted to make this data set publicly available so that other researchers and, and analysts could also use it. Uh, the data descriptor article is also available publicly on the Nature Scientific Data website. And the code for replicating all of this is uh, hosted in GitHub and also can be accessed openly. And therefore we wanted to encourage uh, efforts to build on our work and also replicate it going forward. Next slide, please. Uh, we also created a dynamic data, data visualization interface. Uh, this is also accessible under the website provided there, uh, as you can see. And this uh, uh, visual interface really allows people to go to the website and to dig in further detail and visually see the results of this data set that we've created and the assessment that we've done on access. And so you can go to you know, the pixel level and see what the, what the access in that region is for a given year uh, and so on. Uh, and again, here we present both the binary access indicator, that is people with and without light. So you have the electrification rate, but then also we have these tiers of access, which kind of try to use the proxy of luminosity to map uh, the quality of electricity access and the consumption of electricity in different regions. Next slide, please. So I'll just present a few key results that we've uh, uh, derived from this assessment of progress of electrification in Sub-Saharan Africa in the next couple of slides. Uh, next slide, please. So the first thing that uh, we wanted to try to really um, assess was how unequal is access in Sub-Saharan Africa when we are looking at the provincial level. So we see three sets of graphs here, national, rural, and urban. And uh, basically the colors represent uh, the different tiers of access uh, following the multi-tier framework uh, kind of uh, uh, idea of really thinking about access both in terms of binary, but also other di multiple dimensions here, uh, really trying to reflect luminosity quality. And uh, some of the key results that we see here are that the countries with the largest share of population that don't have any access to electricity also tended to exhibit more inequality in terms of access to electricity. So at a provincial level, you see that there are uh, there are greater inequalities in nations where you have a large fraction of the population without any access to electricity. So what we call tier zero. Uh, furthermore, we also saw that wealth inequality is highly correlated with access inequality. So uh, for countries where we kind of validated our analysis using the multi-tier framework and the DHS data sets, we found that wealth inequality uh, correlates highly with provinces with uh, you have a large fraction of population that is like le less electrified. Um, next slide, please. Uh, another sort of analysis that we tried to do with uh, the work that we did and the data set that we created was to try to identify hotspots or regions where there needs to be greater focus on uh, access expansion efforts. So in particular, we look not only at regions where you have uh, a large population growth with little light growth. So in other words, regions where you have populations where you have um, rapid population growth, but you don't have uh, commensurate growth in, in lit uh, grids. Uh, but then also we try to look at regions where you might have had a uh, uh, binary access to light. In other words, these are grids that have uh, access that show light, but then where uh, the though um, uh, population has grown rapidly, we find that um, luminosity in terms of the quality of light has increased as rapidly. And I think these regions really highlight two different types of hotspots 
that need uh, interventions going forward because regions where you have high population growth but not as fast growth in uh, light availability really reflect many rural regions in sub-Saharan Africa where population is rising but there isn't expansion of access to these uh, increasing population groups. Uh, the other uh, hotspot region is regions that are around urban areas, sometimes within urban areas, where you have high population growth and they do have light, but the intensity of light is not really increasing that rapidly, which kind of indicates that these populations probably have access to light, but are not really using a lot of electricity. So have access to few electric services. Next slide, please. So uh, with this uh, small uh, example of the work that we've been doing, I think I just wanted to kind of close this with uh, making a few uh, concluding points. Uh, the first being that, uh, as is very evident from both the work that Sushita presented earlier and what I've just presented now, Earth observation can be a very important complementary source of information for regular SDG monitoring and tracking. That's very evident. And it also provides you with a, a, a way of reducing the costs of monitoring and tracking sustainable development goals for regions where you don't have uh, easy and regular availability of other data sources. Uh, furthermore, I think geospatial data, because of its uh, high temporal and spatial resolution, can really help in revealing heterogeneity both uh, at national, subnational, and local scales. And that's a big advantage of, of these data sources. Um, uh, and what's very exciting is that uh, satellite data can be used in new and innovative ways that really help to create more than just simple binary indicators of access, but also protect uh, issues of quality and reliability of electricity access, which I think is uh, extremely important in really understanding how people are using electricity and the benefits that they enjoy from those electric services. So I'll end with that and uh, thank you once again for giving this opportunity. Thank you so much, Shanali, for the great insight into modern energy access and pointing out really how fundamental energy is to serving our society and really underpinning all of our basic aspirational goals from lighting and cooking all the way through to mobility and communication. And I think it's so interesting that you looked at luminosity uh, as one of the factors to really assess the quality of access to energy. And I hope that we can talk a little bit more about that in our question and answer session uh, later. So thank you very much. With that, I'd like to uh, introduce our final panelist, uh, Natasha Sadoff, who's the Principal Research Scientist at Battelle. Um, Ms. Sadoff joins us today to provide an overview of her research into engaging with the end user energy utility community and to understand their vulnerabilities and needs in the energy sector. Natasha, thank you so much for joining us. I heard you speak in 2019 at a conference. And when we were curating this particular panel, I thought that you would be a great speaker to talk about a little bit about your work uh, with Battelle. So Natasha, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks for joining us. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Manu. I'm really excited and honored to have been invited. And I agree, I think this is a great fit for um, for this webinar series. So um, I'm really excited to be here to, to talk about the user-driven research and the capacity building work that we're doing at Battelle. Um, I'd first like to acknowledge my team uh, at Battelle, our program collaborators, we have many of them, and our partners at NASA for supporting the work. Um, next slide, please. So we know that the energy management sector um, is very broad. It covers energy sources ranging from fossil fuels to clean energy and renewables, um, but also to reliable energy in terms of generation, transmission, distribution, efficiency, uh, resiliency, and as we've heard about energy access. Um, it's important to note that each of those components have different types of users of data, um, many of whom need earth, earth observations for data-driven decision-making. 
uh, for this project that we've been doing, we're focused on electric utilities, mostly in the US, but we're trying to also think internationally. Um, but electric utilities as a targeted subset of users within this energy management sector, they're already obviously thinking about clean and resilient energy systems. Uh, many of them, most of them are already using earth observation data in the form of uh, ground-based data, drone or camera data, and in some cases, uh, data from NASA or even privately collected earth observation data. Um, so a little bit more about NASA's role in this, NASA satellites obviously collect earth observations uh, on very important and energy relevant variables and parameters um, that can speak to affordable, reliable, and modern energy systems and help increase the share of renewables. Uh, so there are uh, data on meteorological parameters that are relevant for energy, humidity, temperature, precipitation, data on um, issues like drought, flooding, wildfire, uh, wildfire risk and potential, and then of course on uh, renewable resources like solar and wind potential. Um, in some cases, there are fabulous decision support tools and visualization tools that are available. In other cases, it's raw data that's available, um, but NASA in all cases is is offering data that's freely and openly available. Um, as we've heard a little bit um, in the, the two great presentations before, there's a, the role of Earth observations to fill data gaps in, in areas where there's not uh, availability of ground-based data. NASA data are global in coverage in many cases, and there's a long historical record depending on the data set. Um, we found in our work for this end user group that um, they're, the Earth observations through NASA are most applicable for near-term application, but not necessarily um, real-time because of the need uh, to process data between collecting it via satellite and then posting it um, available online. Um, and then generally, uh, NASA Earth observations also have core spatial resolution, which is appropriate for a regional scale, um, not necessarily available at the city block level or anything like that. So important considerations as we think about uh, the landscape of applying these data sets for electric utilities. Next slide, please. So this is um, a little bit of a busy slide, but we wanted, I wanted to make sure that this approach was kind of laid out and um, it's really the crux of what we're doing in terms of a capacity building approach um, that identifies users. And in this case, like I've mentioned, electric utilities being that, that specific user group. Um, but setting out to understand their needs, their, their barriers and accessing data um, and matching that with available and existing NASA Earth observations. And then finally resulting in opportunities to build capacity, evaluate success and identify further needs, communicating those with the, the research community. So um, starting with identifying these end users and uh, engaging with them and understanding what their decision-making needs are um, is critical in understanding what makes data actionable. Um, and that's an important concept that I'll talk a little bit, uh, that I'll talk about a little bit more. So um, we started out by doing a primary needs assessment. We engaged with utilities of varying size, scale, and geography so that we could get a broad perspective of the real world challenges and opportunities that they face. Um, we also conducted a thorough secondary literature review. Um, we, <clears throat> we reviewed existing data sets to see if they fit into this decision-making scale. Um, we did a gap analysis and we analyzed over 140 NASA data sets to, to see, are they relevant to this user group basically um, or not? Uh, so this foundation is critical then in driving the rest of the program and designing capacity building activities. So we're prioritizing in this project targeted information sharing. Um, so our, our goal is to develop a, a story map. If, if any of you are familiar with, with story maps, they're really wonderful visual displays of information. Um, but this will be a curated, uh, a, a, some curated content case studies presented in a way that makes sense to this user group. Um, and we're also making sure to maintain ties with the research community in sharing gaps and barriers, uh, including how they can make sure that their data are accessible and actionable for decision making. Uh, and then finally, I'll note that it's um, important, we feel it's important that we maintain ties with the policy and research community. Um, so we uh, convened an advisory group of governmental representatives, the private sector and academia um, to vet what we're learning, get their perspective um, on key issues like liability and the role of the private sector, which are, are important, um, important issues uh, when engaging with utilities. Next slide, please. 
So the key question out of this project, what does actionable mean? Um, how can we make sure that data for a specific end user group is actionable? Because at the end of the day, data providers are seeking to create something that will be used. Um, and so how do we make sure that data meet the needs of, of users, of electric utilities in this case? So we have found three, t three key takeaways. Um, the first is that electric utility users are looking for data on priority stressors to infrastructure um, environmental stressors like wildfires, storm surge, or periodic flooding, um, whether it's from snow melt or excessive rainfall. Um, some are also looking for data to help meet renewable energy mandates, and these needs are diverse depending on the geography of where um, the utilities are located. So we can see, though, that there are certain meteorological parameters that are helpful across um, across the, the U.S., uh, both for resilience and clean energy, um, so going back to some of those data sets on things like humidity and precipitation, for example. Um, secondly, we see that users are looking for data that are available in the terms that they need it. Um, so in this case, it's that, that means high spatial resolution corresponding with their service area boundaries. Um, we see that various temporal resolutions are useful. Historical data can be useful to evaluate models. Near-term um, data can be useful for operations and management. Um, Real-time data can be useful for emergency response and then projections and forecasts, obviously, for, for planning, um, for resilience, and for understanding conditions into the future. Um, but for this user group, probably for anybody, but in particular for this user group, um, a high level of accuracy with documented limitations is also important. Um, so they need to know if they can put these data into use on day one including the documentation um, to show their management and their shareholders that the data are reliable and trustworthy. And then finally, some utilities also um, are looking for decision support tools, but others are looking for raw data that's interoperable so that they can combine those data sets with their own models that they may be running or with their own decision support tools. Um, and in that case, are the units consistent? Are coverage areas consistent? Um, so NASA is only one provider of Earth observation for this data group. Um, data is also coming from other sources. NOAA is a huge contributor of weather data. The private, se the private sector um, is collecting even finer resolution data. There's other space, space agencies like the European Space Agency that, that's also collecting data. Next slide, please. So, uh, how can we facilitate the process of creating and sharing actionable data? Um, to continue to make Earth observations actionable for specific user groups, uh, which I think is, is a part of the argument that we're making that this process, this process needs to be specific to an end user group. Um, too broad means that maybe the information is out there, but it's not necessarily targeted in a way that specific, uh, specific users or audiences may know how to access it and use it. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm arguing that multi-directional communication and engagement is key um, in identifying the needs, priorities, the gaps, the goals, um, together with end users within the research and the policy communities as well. Um, and so capacity building and a capacity building approach puts users at the center of this process, which is really critical. So on the engagement side, I've mentioned how we're trying to accomplish this. Um, and it's just one one project of many that are taking a look at this, but at least it's a, it's a case study we can think about. Um, so as I mentioned, we've convened an advisory group. Um, we've also been working uh, directly with utilities themselves, engaging as well with industry groups um, who represent utility members and uh, using them as a means of engaging with more utilities, even um, engaging with communities and partnerships of utilities as the test case. Um, and then also con connecting with other agencies in the U.S. government to try to coordinate efforts. Um, but engagement is also needed between data developers themselves and data providers. Uh, we're trying to play that role kind of as a liaison, um, but that's, that's really the key. So the data can be created to be actionable and within the decision-making scale before they're even shared. Um, so multi-directional communication and engagement is, is already becoming a priority across data producing groups within NASA, within other government agencies, but um, I think this just emphasizes the need for that even more. Uh, it, it also gets to the point of more thorough interagency collaboration that's needed. Um, as I mentioned, there's a lot of data coming from, a lot of Earth observation and, and space data um, coming from different parts of the U.S. government. 
Um, and agencies need to continue to work together more to improve the tools that already exist. So um, there's a couple of screenshots on the screen now of data sets, um, or excuse me, more so of um, websites or clearinghouses, um, sources of information that are, that are all really excellent um, in, their, in their own way. But um, can we work across these to, to make them more effective, to, to reduce the number of tools out there and to make the ones that exist um, more targeted targeted for specific end users. So um, in developing our story map, which we're, you know, in a way maybe adding to the problem by adding yet another tool. Um, but I think the goal is that, um, you know, we need to be in depth to a point that it's helpful to this user group um, and connect to other tools that exist. But we're trying to organize information based on case studies um, as well as by raw data sets, since we hear from utilities, but really their big question is, well, who, who else is doing this? How are they doing it? How can we learn from them? Um, so trying to organize in information in a way that, um, that they'd like to see it. So on the information dissemination side, uh, there's still an important role for unidirectional awareness building. Uh, it's still a challenge. It's still a need. And we've seen that um, in particular with this, with this end user group um, in particular. Um, that they know that NASA data is out there. They think it probably has a role in the work that they're already doing, but they really have no idea how to even start a process of, of understanding where the data are, how to use them, what are the limitations, um, all of those important questions and determining if the data are actionable or not. Um, so we need to ask ourselves, how are all of these data um, our users of any type, whether it's utilities or any other user group being engaged how are they learning about data sources that are available and, and how can we connect those dots in a more effective way? Um, so there's other um, means of dissemination that have been very effective, like NOAA's Climate Resilience Toolkit. They have a great story map for utilities um, that they have available that focuses largely on, on NOAA data. Um, NASA obviously is funding our project and we're working to disseminate um, NASA data. Um, NASA also has other resources training resources like the RCEP program. Um, there's a screenshot there of the data pathfinder site, which is great in outlining data sources for various applications. Um, and then I'll also mention the group on, on Earth observations, GEO um, and GEO Veneer, which is the GEO vision for energy. So GEO um, for the space, space data community, um, I hope many or all of you are familiar with GEO because it's a great organization, um, an international community of practice um, over 100 countries, I think uh, 100 more organizations that are represented um, in GEO that uh, basically they advocate for open interoperable data. Um, there's a focus area on energy um, and there's a lot of emphasis on capacity development and um, user engagement, a lot of great activities. Um, and it, it's a great community to be a part of. So this project is also kind of working toward GEO goals of increasing the user base um, the user base of, of Earth observation data, um, as well as pursuing open and interoperable data. Um, so finally, I just want to note that, you know, this um, approach in, in what we've looked at for the U.S. is definitely necessary um, to be applied in other contexts as well. So the electric utility um, end user group in the U.S. Is, is a very diverse group of users, but outside the U.S. that diversity only increases. So um, you know, although we focused on this project primarily on U.S. utilities and end users, we know that there's a lot of potential and a lot of need um, for this abroad as well. So we've mentioned, uh, we've heard already that in some parts of the world, um, energy access and affordability, vulnerability, these are all really important issues. We've also heard um, that there are places in the world, and even in the U.S. as well, it's, it's not unique um, to anywhere, that there's, there may not be enough uh, sufficient sources of ground-based data um, and that's, that's where Earth observation data, including from NASA, can fill an important gap. Um, there's lots of interest, obviously, in clean and resilient energy systems around the world, um, and NASA data can contribute to all of those applications. But ideally, that would be organized and facilitated through a similar process to ensure that we're not just putting data out there, um, but that those data are actionable, um, relevant. Maybe, maybe they're not designed for the certain a certain decision-making scale for a certain end-user group, but that they fit within that scale and that data providers understand what that scale is. Um, so I think the same user engagement process is, is, is important um, to ensure that actionability is really at the front, um, the front of everybody's mind.
So with that, I'll end. Thank you very much. Natasha, thank you so much. And I think it's so important to have conversations and dialogues with the end user community about what their needs are. And as you mentioned, you know, it's not just NASA, it's ESA, but there's other space agencies that have a lot of Earth observation data. So does the private industry as well. And so there's this plethora of data, but how it's being used and why it's being used are the really key questions that we need to keep asking. And uh, I think it's very interesting how, you know, um, if you look at other countries and other uh, regions, whether you would find similarities in the trends or differences in uh, what end users are looking for. So thank you very much, Natasha. So uh, as you know, we've been running a uh, poll question. So let's swap over to that to see how we're doing here. Um, so the question was, what's the biggest obstacle when utilizing space data with regards to uh, making policy changes? And what we are finding from our audience responses is that it's not just, it's not the access to data, it's not that the data is valid, it's not even the funding, but it really comes down to this push to to use data to make policy changes. So Natasha, maybe I can ask you to comment on it, uh, just, you know, basing it on, on your presentation. So here's, you know, the, the user's needs and you're trying to access that, but how do you make that next push to actually um, make policy changes? And, and, you know, you talk about uh, scientifically informed decision-making. Yeah, so this is this is a great question and it's a key question. And I think really, I mean, I see obviously there's um, some consensus around around a lack of political motivation, but really all of these are part of the equation as we've seen. And I I think I would argue that part of perhaps part of the reason why lack of political motivation is is such a, a majority of the answers here is maybe because the data are not actionable enough. Um, and maybe it's it's a connect a, a disconnect between data and then um, how that can be put into use in, in policy um, and and are those data clear enough in, in what um, non technical users like you know managers or decision makers um, what they need in order to make those decisions so um, maybe I'm making a connection where it's it's not quite as strong as um, as some would think but I think that that's an important connection that needs to be made. Um, that speaks again to actionability. I would agree with that. And I think it's really, you know, taking people through the storyline of what the data is. So as the key decision makers, the policy makers understand how the data has been integrated into that decision, I think is, is absolutely crucial. So thank you very much for that. Now, I see that we have a, a number of questions coming in from the audience, and I definitely wanna keep some time uh, for these great questions that we see filtering in. Um, but maybe I wanna start this discussion. And um, uh, Susmita, I might start with you. So. Uh, you, you mentioned the World Bank report uh, that you and your colleagues were working on. Um, and when I was reading the report, one, uh, uh, one line towards the end in the conclusion really stuck to me. Um, the report states that success, and quote, depends on free global information sources so that it can be undertaken as readily in developing country cities as in developed country cities where uh, research has traditionally been conducted. So in your work, what does it mean to have this added um, level of granularity and a broader spatial coverage than has maybe not been there previously? It's a great question. Uh, you know, Previously, we were uh, very much restricted in our air pollution related research or policy analysis by limited data. Finer resolution data was only available for developed countries. In developing countries, as I pointed out, air monitoring is very scarce. There are hardly air monitors. And even if you get data, it is sometimes very difficult to ensure quality and even to compare the readings from two monitors which are in close proximity. Okay. 
But what is happening in last few years is as we are getting more and more uh, geospatial data, final resolution geospatial data, and especially satellite images, it's kind of leveling of the leveling the field. And this now we have data which covers basically the whole world, all regions, all cities. So now all regions can benefit from the rigorous analysis of where this OA pollution is coming from. And we will we can do benefit cost assessment of policy alternatives that were traditionally limited only to well-endowed cities in developed countries. So I truly believe that you know these satellite images and satellite-based data is a game changer. And going back to your poll question, yes, you know, because I'm working in the field for last 29 years. And always we find that policymakers have an inertia uh, to adopt something new. And this satellite data is new. So I think what we need to do is to point out the real worth of it, use of it over and over again. So we need to go with them with case studies, applications that they will be able to relate to. And then that inertia of not using new data uh, will be broken ultimately because information is power. And down the road, everybody would enforce it. That's how I feel it. That's a great response. And, and we're really hoping that by having you all on these sorts of webinars, it, it sparks that inertia and we continue to uh, see how applicable space data can be uh, to the energy sectors, but really to all of the SDGs. And uh, Susmita, you talked about um, the, the project in DAR being a pilot project. So can you talk a little bit about how you could utilize space data even further in the project in Bangladesh and maybe even onwards from there? Uh, of course. Uh, you know, I my research focuses on environmental management and pollution control. Now, nobody argues that air pollution is bad. Nobody argues that, you know, it is causing a lot of health hazard. It is causing productivity loss. But still, what we see is a lot of controversy still there about the exact contribution of different emitting sources of air pollution. How much of air pollution is coming from manufacturing sector? How much of air pollution is generating from transport sector? How much is coming from agriculture? Now, during this COVID lockdown period, we have got anecdotal evidence from different countries that air quality has improved. And during the lockdown periods, we have seen that manufacturing industries did shut down. And you know, in many cities under the lockdown, there was very little transportation. So we are thinking, and we have actually developed a proposal, we are looking for funding, that if we get funding, we will use this space data on air quality from satellites to find out the source attribution of air pollution, how much these different sources are contributing to air pollution in different regions, different countries, different uh, cities, and even rural areas, so that we will be able to design intervention mechanism. So that is what uh, you know will be our future research going forward. Excellent. And I really like that. It's not just, is there air pollution? Is there not air pollution? But what are the secondary effects of, of uh, recognizing that there's high levels of pollution in the area? And that brings me, Shanali, to, to what you were talking about. You know, you talk about luminosity and the quality of light to, uh, to judge what's the access of, um, of electrification. Now, you recently published a really fantastic journal article with your PhD student. Um, and I highly recommend that, uh, that people reach out to you or um, look for that uh, journal publication. But one thing that struck me is that you said that um, if electrification process uh, remains constant in the past six years. So the rate of electrification uh, remains cons um, constant. Full electrification of sub-Saharan Africa by 2030 
will still only be 63%. So in your view, what needs to be done to increase the rate of electrification? Yeah, thank you, Minu. That's a great question and uh, has no simple answer, unfortunately. But there, there are a whole host of things that countries can do actually to improve access to electricity. I mean, and I think uh, what Sushmita was saying earlier about how Earth observation data can really help with democratizing the access to information is, is a very important issue because uh, for many countries, uh, planning for uh, utilities uh, has been something that they struggle with because they, it's difficult to really understand uh, what demand is, to estimate demand and to understand how demand is likely to grow as access to electricity becomes possible. Uh, and therefore, you really need to have uh, a lot of information available to you to really assess where there is access, where there is not access, where access has been provided, but demand is growing or not growing and understand the causal factors for why that is happening. Uh, and earth observation data, of course, have a role to play there. I mean, they're not the only thing you need, but they are a really good complementary source of information. Um, in addition to sort of improving this planning for utilities, of course, there are a whole host of other things that need to happen to expand access to electricity in regions where there are there isn't sufficient access to electricity. And this includes things like uh, access to finance, uh, which is a big uh, gap in many places. Uh, and, and moreover, uh, really innovations both in institutional, uh, social and the technical sphere. So, I mean, we've talked about regions where they're very remote, they're very low population density, uh, they are far from existing grid sources of, of uh, generation and distribution. And these regions just cry out for decentralized solutions where you have off-grid sources to at least provide an interim way to provide access to electric services. Uh, over a period of time, these regions uh, might then get integrated to the grid, both through these decentralized options becoming part of the grid or through extension of a central grid. Uh, but um, clearly there are uh, big gaps in terms of trying to find solutions that fit local contexts. Uh, and then finally, I think there's also a huge area of business uh, model development that needs to get increased focus because uh, when we're talking about access to electricity for the lowest income consumers, uh, these are consumers that have very unsteady cash flows. Uh, so, and affordability is a big, big constraint in terms of their ability to enjoy different electricity services. So thinking about alternative business models, whether it's pay-as-you-go services or pay-for-service models and so on, these are critical to really providing uh, access that, that is then affordable to low-income consumers. So I'll leave it at that here. And of course, there's a lot more one can say about this, but uh, I know you have more questions. Thank you. Thank you, Shanali. Uh, just one more question. Uh, so you and your paper talk very uh, avidly about uh, SDG indicator 7.1.1, which really looks at uh, electricity access on a household level. So you were talking about binary estimation of access, but how do we go beyond the traditional use of space data to provide more insight into how countries are progressing towards SDG 7.1.1? Yeah, another great question. So, I mean, of course, uh, tracking at a global level needs to be somehow simple so that nations can do this on a regular basis. But uh, at the same time, you don't want to make it so simple that it's not really providing you with enough information to really then plan going forward. So uh, one of the, the efforts to 
improve on uh, tracking and monitoring of electricity access, that's 17, uh, SDG 7.1.1, is to really think about other multidimensional measures of access. So going beyond the binary, as you said in your question, that's not just looking at whether a household has a connection or not, whether a household has light or not, but going beyond that to try to assess what is the quality of access that that household has. So in other words, uh, uh, do they have reliable supply? Do they have a supply that affords them enough uh, access to services to, uh, to benefit from that supply? So in this regard, uh, the pa paper that we worked on uh, in One Earth that you referred to uh, really tried to look at access in more than a binary sense by also developing this uh, proxy for quality of uh, electricity access, which was really to try to look at the distribution of light radiance in different countries and to look at tiers of light radiance in different countries as a proxy for the, the quantity of access that these households might have. So how much light are they really using? And, and with this, we kind of linked it with the World Bank's multi-tier framework for electricity access measurement to really try to see uh, what is the distribution of light radiance in terms of these tiers of electricity access. And, and, and that was very, very enlightening to us because in addition to understanding that, of course, connections and the progress with providing connections has been unequal across different regions of Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, even more so, even for people who have access to electricity, that means do have light, do have a connection. We find that for many of them, they continue to use very, very low levels of electricity. And this uh, measured in terms of these radiance tiers that I talked about. Uh, so this, this again highlights uh, um, a gap where policy really needs to fit in and, and expand efforts to providing access to electricity by really looking at not just providing connections, but going beyond connections to really provide reliable, affordable and sustainable electricity supply so that people can benefit from the services that electricity provides. Thanks. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for emphasizing the fact that it's not just about data, it's not just about connections, but it's really how data and connections are being utilized. Natasha, I want to go to you. Um, you know, we saw it within our poll results that it's really not about access to data, but it's these other barriers that come about. When working with uh, and, and having these conversations with the end users, what are some of the barriers that electric utility data end users are facing in accessing or even optimizing their use of space data? So um, I can give information on that based on the utility and user group that we're working with who um, are, it's an interesting group of, of users to be thinking about because, you know, there, there's a lot of these issues with the private sector and information needs to be, uh, you know, I've mentioned the documentation requirements in terms of limitations and um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of that that's involved in working with this end user group, but um, for utilities, access to information is actually still a big barrier. Um, and it's, it's not that the information is not out there, the information is out there, um, but it's a matter of where do you, where do you get it? Um, NASA data is available everywhere, but that's part of the problem um, is, you know, how do you know what to look for, how to apply it? Um, so the same data set may be available in several different places. Um, it, it, it's not, um, the, the data portals through which you can um, access NASA data are not necessarily user-friendly. So the access to information is still a critical barrier. Um, but then secondarily, as I mentioned, the utility of that information, um, if, um, you know, especially with the diversity within utilities, of, there are some utilities that have one person that's been assigned to think about resilience um, or to start 
to start thinking about how can we meet this renewable energy mandate um, or these, you know, these other policy drivers. So when there's one person that is not necessarily, um, you know, an earth observation analyst or an engineer or any sort of scientist, um, obviously that's a huge uphill battle. Yet there are other utilities that have entire teams, um, uh, entire teams of meteorologists and hydrologists and um, and scientists who who understand what um, what they're doing, but then they also have the funds to purchase data from other sources, whether it's you know private sector. There's a lot of um, really interesting organizations, and many of whom are, are using NASA data, but um, they're combining that with their own drone data or, or other data that they're collecting. Um, so you have this huge range of of users. So that's something else to keep in mind. But um, you know the the utility users who have those teams of scientists are looking for raw data sets that they can bring in um, to their system. But uh, you know there is a lot. There are a lot of means of obtaining raw data. Um, so that's beneficial. But then it gets back to that question of awareness. Do they know what's available? Do they know how to get it? Um, on the side of that one that one sole person who's now in charge of, of resilience planning, you know, they're more interested in the visualization tool um, that might be available just, you know, online. But the question is then, um, what are the outputs in that visualization tool? Um, something as simple as um, units or the spatial, um, the output, you know, are the polygons consistent with their service area? Probably not. So can those be changed? Um, so that's part of why that dialogue and conversation is so important, that those are likely things that can be changed, um, that if, if data providers and data users have those conversations, whether it's utilities or in any application, sharing that um, conversation on actionability and decision making and um, one little tweak to a data set that might all of a sudden open the door to a whole new subset of users. Um, so I think it's kind of all of those things, but again, since utilities are such a wide, um, diverse, and unique set of users, um, you know the the barriers are pretty <laughs> pretty wide and, and diverse too. Thank you so much, Natasha. So I do realize that we're quickly coming up to uh, the end of our webinar. And so I do want to shift over to uh, some of the questions that we've got from the audience. So as many of you are working uh, with policymakers, maybe we can touch on the first question. Uh, so Smita, maybe I can ask you to respond to this. So what are some of the, the obstacles or barriers that policymakers are uh, finding when you present your work to them? Are there barriers? And if so, what could they be? Again, this is a great question. Um, I think there is no single answer to the question. You know, it depends on the situation we are facing. Just to give you an example, I find that, you know, policymakers sometimes just bring their baggage or their old ideas, but when we confront them with facts and data, they're open to listening. Uh, you know, when we started working in indoor air, on indoor air pollution in early 2000, I distinctly remember that when I uh, faced some policymakers in South Asia, they just told me that, you know, women are cooking with these different kinds of fuels and different kinds of traditional stoves for years. So why are you bothering about it? It's going on for centuries. But then, you know, we monitored air quality in the kitchens of different households and we went there and we showed them filter papers which went into the machine in milk white color and came out within a day in different shades of gray and black. And we showed them and we told them that if the filter paper accumulates so much dust in 24 hours, think about a woman who is cooking in this kitchen day after day, month after month. And, you know, everybody agreed that it was a problem. Then we started talking about what can be done about it, okay? And again, we realized that when we are talking about many different countries with varying circumstances, we need to come up with a menu of options, intervention options. Because if we can provide access to clean energy, clean fuel to all the households, 
that will be great. But will we be able to provide access to clean fuel to all the poor households all over the world in next X number of years? If not, you know, think about menu of options. And we started brainstorming it with policymakers, and they were open to ideas. And we realized that for a section of population, access to clean energy will help. For a section of population, access to improved stove will well, work well. And for a section of population, we need to promote the awareness that cooking in kitchen, where uh, there is a lot of smoke, it is bad for health. So they need to uh, keep their doors and windows of the kitchen open. And we need to improve the ventilation characteristics and ventilation behavior. So, and then it came, uh, the question, we entered into the question of dialogue of funding, where the funding will come from. So it's a you know, sequential uh, process of discussion with policymakers, but I find that all across these regions from Sub-Saharan Africa to South Asia, East Asia, Latin America, most of the time when we work with information and when we give them evidence-based research results, policymakers are open to discussion and they also enter into a dialogue where they, where they share very frankly the limitations they are facing and how, what can be done about it. You make such an important point is to also understand their limitations. You know, we always see it from the side of like, oh, here's the data. Now you can make the changes that are necessary. But they also have uh, their hands tied with something. So that's a very good, um, good point. And that dialogue, again, is absolutely uh, essential. Shanali, I might come to you on a kind of related question. You were talking about um, the fact that maybe low income communities might not be able to access and afford uh, energy. So the question here is, um, what sort of what causes these obstacles for sustainable inclusive development? And when you talk with policymakers regarding your research, how can we better utilize data, uh, in general data, for solving some of these obstacles that come about? Yeah, I mean, I think in many cases, uh, it's really a question of informing through science uh, to understand what are uh, barriers in terms of affordability, in terms of accessibility of different services. Uh, whether it's electricity or other services, uh, clean water, clean cooking, uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, in many cases, uh, uh, as, as Sushmita said already, it's an iterative process. So you begin with informing policymakers, you use science and you use data and uh, to really uh, show them the evidence in terms of cause and effect of different things. Uh, so when you come to uh, issues of affordability, I mean, low income households, uh, they have irreg irregular sources of, of uh, cash, they have irregular employment, they are often on farms, uh, and uh, their, their cash flows are linked to the agricultural cycles. So in periods of post harvest, they may be flush with cash. In other periods, they may not be. Uh, and this, this kind of information is very useful to pol policymakers to understand uh, and to be reminded about because it then means that the kinds of interventions that you design can be tailored to that context. So for instance, in cases where uh, you might have a, a large population that is rural and agrarian, and you want to provide them with access to clean and uh, modern energy services, you might think about seasonal vouchers as one option, uh, where you say, okay, in, in seasons where there are households are cash poor, then you provide them with a voucher. Uh, and then uh, you might think about other means of sort of providing easy credit uh, or loans uh, so that people can, can still avail of these services uh, at times when they may not have the cash flow available to them. Uh, I mean, of course, there are a whole host of other policy measures that you could think of. You could think of different types of social support policies um, 
where uh, people are given uh, different forms of uh, income support or um, uh, credit support or even support in terms of um, equipment. Uh, in, in India, there has been a huge policy to increase access to clean cooking for poor households. In, in this particular policy, uh, this LPG stove and the first cylinder was provided for free uh, for many, many households. Uh, now, this was a policy that helped a lot in increasing connections in terms of connections to LPG, uh, to gas cooking. But then, of course, it doesn't mean the problem is solved because even people who have that connection now aren't necessarily regularly using the LPG because they are uh, facing constraints with that. So it's, it's an iterative process of really understanding what are the issues, what are the constraints, uh, where can you uh, overcome barriers, how can you overcome barriers, and, and dialoguing with policymakers to really help inform them and then provide them with options, uh, a menu of options, as Sushmita mentioned as well, to really then uh, help them move forward in terms of interventions and implementations. Yeah, and you're absolutely right when you say it's an iterative process. And I, I want to point out um, that I really appreciate the fact that you're making your research public, as you mentioned in your presentation. So um, other research organizations, we can build on this. Uh, and I think that these iterations, of course, will develop depending on different circumstances. We see how things have changed within COVID-19 itself. And, you know, you talk about seasonal changes. There's, there's just so much that happening. And if we can all learn from each other, uh, the more valuable we will all be for it. So thank you very much, Shanali. Um, Natasha, I have a question that's poised directly to you. Um, has there been any efforts to make an international system that's universally understood so that data can be shared and utilized? You know, we're talking about uh, NASA data, NOAA data, European Space Agency, other agencies, private companies. Is there an international system that already exists or is there an idea to potentially create one? So this is, um, it's a good question. And to my knowledge, there is, there's not an international system. I think GEO is a, a forum through which this could happen. And I know there are efforts um, with solar energy in particular to make um, data that's collected through the European Union, through um, private efforts in the US, um, with NASA, through, through different sources to try to bring everybody together and share data through a common system. But um, to, to the best of my knowledge, it's really been in targeted, targeted ways like that. Um, but I think that that's kind of what's needed. That, um, and this is this is unfortunately the reality of the funding landscape. Is um, if there was an opportunity for um, all of these data providers to come together, um, and for it not to be siloed in terms of not just even U.S. Um, and within the U.S., like NASA, NOAA, DOE, um, but internationally, NASA, ESA, JAXA, uh, you know, across all of these, I don't want to use the word silos, maybe that's too strong, but across all of these data providers, um, a, it would be a big effort. Uh, and then, you know, everybody would need to come to consensus on who exactly this is going to serve. Um, but I think that's what's needed. Uh, and I think the pieces are there. It's just, whether it's um, the, a facilitator, a funder, um, a forum for, for making it happen, I think that that would be important. But again, the point is that, you know, who would that be targeted to, to uh, help? Uh, and what would the process be to make sure that a tool like that um, would actually meet the needs of, of that targeted group? Great, thank you so much, Natasha. Now I do know that we're uh, almost at the end of our webinar, but I, I thought this, this question was very interesting and I would like for each of you to reflect on it. So, uh, you know, as, as researchers and people who are um, uh, representing industry, academia, um, uh, uh, NGOs, development organizations, we often see this data and we're, we're constantly sort of, um, you know, playing around with it, but we don't always 
uh, tell that story to the public. And so the question is, what types of efforts are being made to present this data to the public so that there's an increased awareness of some of the challenges that we're facing as humanity and some of the solutions that we're also coming up with. So Susmita, maybe I can start with you. What is the World Bank doing to present this data? World Bank has open knowledge policy. So whatever data we collect in connection with our projects and research, it is open access and it is posted on our website. And sometimes when we work with data from other sister agencies, if we produce derivatives, then those indicators are also posted on World Bank website. These are open access. Just to give you an example, in last year, I posted from my research uh, for the entire terrestrial world at one square kilometer resolution, data on biodiversity indicators so that if any project is taking place in forested area, one would be able to figure out, you know, where uh, threatened and critically threatened species are, where the species are which are unique to the region and uh, where you know you have species with high uh, extinction probability in next 5, 10, 50, 50 years. So this data that we created is open access and it can be accessed very easily from the World Bank website. So once again, whatever we are doing with the world in connection with the World Bank projects, unless the data is proprietary, it is open access. And I would like to stress Shonali's point here that space data has opened new doors for problem solving, but all other sources are also coming up with data and all this data needs to be worked together. Uh, and I think then we would move forward to a better future. Great, very happy to hear that. Shanali, I might hand this to you. As researchers, we're sometimes guilty of speaking jargon. How do we make uh, our, our research more accessible to the public? Yeah, I mean, very true. We, we sometimes speak to our own, so we tend to uh, use a lot of jargon. But uh, I think increasingly, even within the research community, there's a huge effort now to really communicate research results even to lay public because we understand that to mobilize efforts, one needs to really increase awareness across the board among citizens, amongst NGOs, amongst policymakers. I mean, the whole spectrum of stakeholders really need to be informed in terms of what the issues are and how one can find solutions to move forward. Uh, at, our, at my own institution, IASA in Austria, uh, we also have uh, an increasingly open access policy in terms of trying to make public all the research that we are doing. Uh, we have uh, our own repository where we make publicly available both data sets, uh, often models and codes as well, uh, but then also the, the publications that follow from this. Uh, uh, this is an ongoing process. Not everything is open access as yet, but increasingly funders are also demanding this and that helps and pushes us in that direction. So, I mean, I think this is a matter of time. Within a few years, this will be standard practice. Uh, all, all research, all data that comes out of research that's generated, uh, all results will become open access and, and will be posted on, on websites, uh, institutional websites, other websites, and, and really help to inform all, all stakeholders in terms of what the situation is. Uh, I think another big um, initiative that's really taking off the ground now, now is citizen science. So this is really involving citizens in doing data gathering and in validating some of the data that we are using. Uh, and that's another direct way to really publicly involve the populations and communities who are affected by the issues that we're studying. So I'll leave it at that. 
you're absolutely right. And I'm so glad that you pointed out citizen science because there's, there's projects that really rely on citizens to get involved to generate the data and also help analyze the data. So thank you very much for that. Uh, Natasha, I'll hand over the last word to you. You talk about capacity building amongst uh, electric um, utility user community. Do you speak to the consumers? Um, is that in your your realm of your research? So it's not necessarily in this project, um, but I think that's important that you know the, we're not actually collecting any raw data ourselves. So the question of open data is less relevant for our project, although obviously NASA and GEO, um, all the data is openly available and, um, and shared. Um, but it's it's not just even the scientific community with obviously there's peer reviewed publications and presentations, but we also try um, broadly across different projects to have that voice with the public and um, we try to find opportunities for guest blogs, for example, um, or posts that are in more popular sites, gray literature. Um, so making that connection, I think, is important. And with, and with utilities, I mean, it's only one step removed really from, I guess, the public, as you, as you could say. Um, because they're not necessarily scientists, they're not necessarily um, analysts, they're trying to put these data into very practical use. Um, so we're also trying to find ways in, in connecting with utilities and, you know, for example, trade associations and magazines and, and alternative ways that we can be sharing um, concepts and information and um, raising awareness. So not just through scientific means, but also uh, more broadly. Thank you so much, Natasha. So we're about to wrap up our webinar for today. And I'd like to close by firstly thanking our fantastic panel of experts for sharing their work, their research, and their unique perspectives with us. I'd also like to thank you, the audience, for a really engaging discussion. And, you know, we didn't get through half as many questions that were sent in, and I really hope that this is um, a catalyst of, of dialogue that still needs to occur. As we've done with previous uh, Serving Society with Space Data webinars, we will be following up with our participants, uh, you, the audience, with a short survey to continue the dialogue and engage with you, um, who are our multi-stakeholder audience, uh, in a discussion of how space technology and geospatial applications are not only contributing to achieving the sustainable development goals, but really highlighting the opportunities and the challenges in expanding the use of satellite data. So please stay tuned for our next webinar in the series. We will be looking at SDG3, which is good health and well-being in two weeks time. So that's the 5th of August. So once again, thank you so much to our co-organizers, the Secure World Foundation, and to our tech and communications team. I wish you all a very um, healthy next couple of weeks, next couple of months. Please stay well, and we look forward to continuing to uh, dialogue with you and continuing this important discussion with you all. Thank you very much.